regulations for digital markets have been implemented in many countries and many others are being developed. The European Union is discussing a new Digital Market Act, a regulation package to shape the future of the digital economy in Europe, which will have far-reaching implications. Which ones? That's exactly what we're going to discuss at the next ses session of the State of the Union conference moderated by Giacomo Calzolari, Professor of Economics at the European University Institute and Research Fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Thank you, um, and welcome everybody. Uh, as I said, I'm Giacomo Cancellari. I'm an economist at the European University Institute, and uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today uh, to uh, discuss and moderate the panel on uh, regulating the global digital economy, what role for international cooperation. So let me start really thanking our panelists. Uh, I will introduce them in a moment. But I also want to thank our audience uh, for this late event that is, has been necessary uh, to accommodate uh, different time zones around the world. So this is going to be an intense panel. Uh, we have many distinguished uh, panelists, speakers, and we only have uh, 50 minutes for a topic that I'm sure could take us uh, discussing for hours. Um, so without further ado, let's set uh, the scene. So I would say that there is a general consensus that the tools we currently have, uh, typically coming from competition policy that uh, intervene exposed on markets, have effects that are too small, they arrive too late, and then to be not particularly effective when applied to digital markets. So although we don't necessarily all agree with these statements, we could say that nevertheless, the train of regulation has already left the station. So here we are in fact discussing the fact that many countries with different attitudes um, have proposed or discussing new regulations, new approaches for digital markets. For example, Europe is uh, participating in this process with the, uh, the new Digital Market Act, uh, actually a combination of acts, uh, proposals, the Digital Market Act with the G Digital Service Act, together a package that uh, may actually shape uh, the future digital economy, not only in Europe, uh, but also let's mention the Data Governance Act. So with this panel, we want to explore how and to what extent these uh, regulations will set new standards in digital markets and how they will affect relations with non-European countries and companies. Um, as I said, it's going to be intense and unfortunately with only a few minutes for each panelist. And so I, I would like also to set the rules of the game for our panel. So we are going to have two rounds of questions. Uh, with please short answers. Um, the first round, uh, I would like our panelists to tell us what they think is today the most relevant issue with regulation of digital markets in general. Um, I'm sure there will be differences which uh, will make this panel's view rich and interesting. Um, in the second round, I would instead like um, to ask our panelists to elaborate on the global dimension of these issues. Um, finally, we will uh, hopefully have some time left for a short round of Q&A questions from uh, our audience. Um, so let's start with the, the first round um, and uh, we democratically proceed in alphabetical order. So I'm gonna ask um, uh, Vincenzo Amendola, who is under secretary of state of, for European affairs of the Italian government. Uh, to break the ice. Thank you, Vincenzo. And uh, let's start. You are muted, Vincenzo. Yes. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Professor. Mm, big greetings to all the guests. Thank you for the democratic orders. That was my problem at school every time. And I will try to open the debate in a way that uh, 
I can facilitate. I think that, that this is the cornerstone of the European Union legislation for the next years, because all the three regulations that we are going to have it and to discuss it will strengthen the cooperation between European Union and between within the countries uh, uh, that are composing this frame. Of course, first point is to update ourselves. When we speak about open uh, strategic autonomy of the European Union, we think two main pillars. One is green and one is digital. That are two twins that they have to work together. But of course, we know that this regulation, they have to not just to boost the European capacity and in terms of uh, our economical approach and also our in, turn, in terms of industrial approach, but we have also to compare it with the technological uploading because sometimes the European regulation comes later. And when we speak about technological uh, um, development, we can also be so late. So first of all, is a way to strengthen our unity in terms of European Union. And for the first time, and this is the big change, and I will conclude, is that we have also resources, because you know Europe for many years, we, we compelled with a lot of statement without any resources. All the next generation plan, 20% will mean resources to implement our digital framework and our digital cooperation. Just for Italy, will be something like 42.5 billions in terms of data, technology, infrastructure. So it's a big boost. From one side, regulation to the other side means resources to, to develop. But our way to discuss among the European, and then we check also globally what does it mean, is to, to have a quick speed analysis, regulation, implementation, because the technological development in Europe was one of the pillars that we never developed in the last period. And if we want to be a global competitor, we need to, to fast our way to, to, to be part of this global competition. Thank you, Vincenzo. Thanks a lot. So next in turn, uh, Cristina Caffara. Cristina, she's a senior consultant to Charles Rivers Associates in Europe. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you so much, Giacomo. Thanks uh, for this invitation. And I think it is important, even though I have very little time as a private sector speaker, to always start with a brief disclosure because it's a question of integrity for me. Uh, and people who listen need to know where people come from. Just briefly, I've done work adverse to Google. I work for multiple regulators. I've done uh, work for Amazon, for Apple, for uh, Netflix, for Uber, for Microsoft. So these uh, are, are some of the past clients. Let me start with, um, I mean, the question you pose is what is the current burning issue in, in these markets and, and, and why are we defaulting to regulation? In fact, I'd say there are two related problems. There is a market power problem and there is a privacy data protection problem. And they are absolutely interrelated because the market power is the one that allows the violations of privacy and data protection. Uh, and in turn, these violations support uh, and entrench the market power. So we are in a world uh, of surveillance, a wash with tracking, uh, under siege from personal ads, my phone is listening to me, all of the way to amplification and hate speech. And the one big problem that is uh, flowing from that is the persistent way in which we continue to look at these two problems that are two sides of the same coin as separate. All, uh, we have regulators operating in silos. We have the antitrust regulators and we have the privacy data protection regulators. And on each side, particularly on the antitrust side, there is a significant reluctance to engage with the data protection privacy issue, which are at the core of the problem we face today. You talk to the antitrust people, they say, well, we don't do data protection. It's called the privacy people over there. We are the antitrust people. We do market power only. And that distinction, that siloing, that church is at the source of a lot of the lack of understanding and the problems. So how have the, the, the antitrust people done by themselves? Have they done really well? No, of course, as you said at the beginning of, of, your, of your introduction, antitrust regulators have mis frankly floundered so far. In Europe, we've had cases against Google, which have failed miserably. Uh, there have been uh, fines that have gone nowhere and certain remedies have been ineffectual. We've never achieved to do anything uh, with Facebook other than allowing through toxic mergers one after the other. We have a, a, an antitrust theater going on with Amazon and Apple, and we'll see where that takes in maybe five years. 
So this is why we are defaulting uh, to the DMA, the regulation, and that is certainly something which uh, is, is going to be occupying many of us and certainly those on this panel for some time. The reality though is that, let's face it, we have nothing to show for it so far. Huh? Profits are soaring for these companies. The market cap is going up. Um, there is certainly no sense that they're scared or anticipating a great big fear. Uh, what we're seeing and what we will see, and I hope that Andrea Schwab here is, is going to handle this and take it to the other way uh, with, with the parliament process, is a, an attempt to put forward regulation, which is uh, certainly remarkable at the current time. The rules that have been proposed are a mishmash of things. It's not clear to many how they're going to be actually operational, how they're going to constrain these companies with very different business models. It's very easy to say don't sell preference, but it means different things for different business models. So we need to be precise if we want them to absolutely stop doing bad things. It's not enough to enunciate a general principle. So I think uh, it will be a big job to take this to be something that is actually implementable, but it is extremely important given the failure of antitrust uh, so far. And then briefly, and to conclude, this is not the only game in town, of course. We'll talk about international uh, scene, and we have, of course, the US, who at the moment is totally unimpressed with regulatory developments, and they think, well, we are going to do antitrust litigation. Thank you very much, and we'll see where we get. So we're at different stages in this curve, but we can talk about that in the second part. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christina. Thank you. So next in line, Ziyang Fan is a head of digital trade at World Economic Forum. So Ziyang, thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor. And before I answer the question, maybe I can suggest to maybe just to reframe the uh, uh, question a bit. Uh, personally, I prefer the term technology governance instead of uh, technology uh, regulation. Uh, regulation obviously is a major part of governance, but there's definitely a lot more uh, than uh, just regulation. Um, you know, by you know, by definition, you know, uh, regulation takes time, whereas the development technologies is much much faster. And also, you know, regulation implies a top-down governmental approach. And as we all know, especially in the tech space, we need a lot more stakeholders uh, to really uh, achieve our goals. So to answer the question, definitely tons of issues in, you know, privacy, trust, et cetera, and, uh, competition, my uh, distinguished uh, fellow panelists will address that. For me, I work in digital trade, so cross-border uh, global uh, uh, space. So for me, interoperability is really the key uh, issue here. Uh, if you look at the regulation, uh, um, no matter from what country or region, you know, regulations have borders and internet doesn't. And that's a real, real uh, challenge. You know, uh, some examples, you know, the data transfer is obviously something we all um, know, we, we know well, well, uh, the data privacy, you know, um, uh, rules, you know, vary from uh, place to place. You know, GDPR certainly has become the de facto rule uh, globally in a way and uh, the gold standards, but not all places, right? Not all countries and regions uh, ha have uh, similar rules as, as GDPR. And so how do, how do we make sure that all those rules can, can work uh, with each other? Um, uh, and what if, you know, there is an even more stricter rule than GDPR comes out? How should Europe uh, react uh, to that? Uh, another example uh, is uh, digital payments, right? Uh, I can send my email in an uh, instant uh, to the other side of the world, but if I want to send any payments, it takes literally days, right? And it's, it's in many ways, it's the fragmented regulations, right? The different uh, uh, anti-money laundering, no customer rules and licensing regimes, et cetera, uh, whereas the the rules uh, from one country uh, uh, is not interoperable with another. So that even if you have the technologies that that are, are that are uh, that are, that exist that can, that would enable you to move the funds, the regulatory uh, side, uh, it, the challenges that we need to uh, overcome. Um, of course, you know um, another example from uh, digital trade is that the digitizing uh, uh, documents uh, right now. Uh, in many places, we would still need uh, physical, literally physical documents uh, for uh, for global trade. Uh, but when we move to the digital space, there are so many different data models and data standards. So those are uh, another uh, example. So interoperability for me is one of the most relevant issue. Thank you. Thanks a lot. 
uh, Marietta Schake, she's the International Policy Director at the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford University. Thank you, Marietta. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to join you, although, of course, Florence is a little bit more appealing than the screen. Uh, we hope to be able to, uh, to visit Italy again soon. Let me just try to take a slightly different angle than the previous two speakers who have said uh, very wise, or three speakers, apologies, uh, very wise words. When we think about regulating, uh, let us not forget that regulating is not an outcome, it's a process that can lead to a gazillion different destinations. But if you ask me what I believe the priority is in terms of regulating the global economy, it should be to tilt the balance back in favor of protecting public values and the public interest. In some ways, I believe one of the biggest problems of the digital world, the digital market, is the market itself. The outsized power for companies when it comes to governing technology, setting standards, making very impactful products and services that essentially end up eroding some of the roles that democratic governments have. And so when we look at international collaboration, multilateralism, I actually believe it is high time that countries, governments believe in democracy, the rule of law and human rights, try to work together towards a tech governance model that puts the public interest first, that makes sure that there is independent oversight, that there is uh, more transparency than we have now, and that there is a comprehensive vision around the impact at the crossroads of security, economy, and rights, because they all come together in the technology. That's why there is a real need to have a comprehensive model. And it's hard to speak of just, you know, regulating one element of the economy or another. I'm happy to talk about this more, but this is my uh, initial effort to say what I think the priority should be. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andreas Schwab, is member of the European Parliament and rapporteur of many important uh, proposals for the European Parliament. And by the way, frequent speaker at the European Institute. So Andreas, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Calzalari, uh, for your invitation. And I'm honored to speak at this very important round uh, of uh, uh, very um, intelligent contributions. I think um, that the key message that the European Union is giving is uh, that this legislation, which is composed by several acts and several um, tools, it's about making sure that our basic European constitutional principles that link Italy and Germany and further beyond the countries, that they are really put back into the center of the digital markets. Uh, and therefore, I, I very much like the, the comment of Mr. Fun that it's about governments. We want that democracy and open speech is at the center. We want that freedom of citizens, freedom of speech of citizens is at the center. And you want also markets being fair because in a democracy, it's not only important that citizens have a freedom, but also that businesses can start from zero with the freedom to reach out to markets and are not blocked. And these basic values, these fundamental values that we have all together in 27 member states of the European Union, these values we want to bring in. And therefore, it's also important that we have a global outreach. And we have seen recent cases where uh, platforms that link us, and they are very useful as uh, innovative tools to link a global world, have been shown examples where we Europeans would have a different stance. And we want to have a common approach onto this to make sure to the platform world um, that we are united and that we put the citizens and the rights, the fundamental rights of the citizens first. For sure, this is in a global governance, not an easy task, but we should endeavor to get the best outcome. Thank you so much, Andreas. Um, this has been very interesting round as uh, I was uh, uh, reviewing. So um, then uh, next step I would like to cover with you is uh, to think about, uh, so you mentioned different uh, and important aspects of the topic of our panel. So what I would like uh, to discuss now with you is um, how do we uh, uh, cooperate? Um, so clearly there is a global dimension in what we are saying. Uh, we are talking about markets that 
do not really face boundaries. No, so digital markets don't have boundaries. Uh, so how do we cope uh, with this type of environment? Um, how it is possible for countries or a set of countries to start um, uh, intervening, regulating in, uh, in digital markets? And uh, so let's start again with our uh, uh, round. So Vincenzo, I'm back to you. Yes, thank you. I, um, thanks to all the intervention because we're um, amazing. I, I want to recall what Mariette say about comprehensive framework because this is the, our problem in terms of legislation that we have to have comprehensive framework taking account of all the, uh, the, the, the identity card of the European Union in terms of freedom, uh, respects of the human rights and so on. At the same moment, we are a free market and open market and our strategic autonomy was always to be considered open. Is we are, um, we are going in this direction in terms of vision. So when a member of parliament, a member of government, they have to implement this regulation, all these three new regulations, they have to upload itself in a, in a way that is, is amazing if you think the challenge that is in front of us and the big delay that the European Union has it. But when I, we speak about strategic autonomy, it means that we are open for cooperation. And when we speak about cooperation, the strong cooperation within European Union means also a strong cooperation with the, those partners that share our values, starting from, for example, United States, where we are working uh, and this particular new administration is going in the direction that uh, we really appreciate it. So the partnership between the, the firms of both sides of the Atlantic, they, are, they have to confront itself to the same big question, the comprehensive approach, the market uh, capability and the technological development that we have to share. I like also the European Union that uh, play a role in the so-called level playing field because in the digital space and the inclusion of entire production system in the value chain means also uh, to call for a multilateral approach that has to have uh, some reciprocity with other country that we had no in the past. And we know that also in some cases, the digital space is also based on value. And uh, based on value means also to secure our value for our citizen data. So comprehensive approach, European regulation, a strong partnership with the country that they share the same values that we have. Thank you, Vincenzo. Cristina, it's your turn. The global well, let me, yes, I'm, I'm an antitrust person and I listen with interest to, to these different points of view. Let me start, try and put a slightly provocative perspective. Of course, we all agree violently that there is a need for some sort of international convergence, okay? But there is, I mean, in a way we are converging towards similar goals. I want to see international getting on with it, not more discussions about what convergence may mean. And I don't mind a level of experimentation along different paths as long as we are getting on with it. Because what I want to not see is further delays and cases that take too long and the regulation that takes far too long and gives incredible leeway for companies to continue to do nothing, which is the reason why we can see, as I said before, capitalization that are stellar because nobody believes that antitrust and regulation have got any teeth because nobody has ever done very much. So what we are seeing now in Europe, yes, there are sort of common values, but it isn't the only show in town. And this idea of the Brussels effect, I think has lost a little bit of its shine. We have initiatives in parallel in the UK, which is certainly doing its own thing. In Germany, Germany is doing its own thing also in parallel within the constraint. Australia is a super important agency that is doing its own things, not through regulation, but through markets inquiries and setting out uh, sort of design of, 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 of remedies. And then you have, of course, the super important poll of the United States. The United States are agreeing with uh, the, the sort of general goals, but they're not going about it in the same way for very 
clear cultural, historical, legal reasons. They have nothing in common with the old liberal fairness principles. They are coming to it if they are on the extreme left. They're saying this is all about dispersion of economic power. Um, if they are on the extreme right, they're saying break them up. And in the middle, we, you have the moderates. They say, well, let's give a chance to reinvigorating antitrust litigation. And it isn't entirely the federal government. A lot of the work I'm involved in with the state AGs is state level, right? It's litigation brought about by the states. So we are in a world in which we are observing, yes, a general kind of convergence of sort of goals, but the ways to get there are very diverse and not everybody is falling into line with the Brussels effect, but that's okay for me. I would like to see experimentation in this kind of field. More people doing slightly different things as long as we get on with and not leave it too late. I'll stop here. Thank you, Christina. Merhet. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was wrong. <laughs> no uh, problem. Uh, Ziang, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, I mean, the title of this panel is, you know, regulating the global uh, digital economy, what role for international cooperation? Uh, I think there, uh, obviously a tremendous role for international cooperation, but how do we do it? Uh, maybe I can offer two suggestions, one from the public governmental uh, perspective and one from the public and private uh, partnership perspective. Uh, one from the government or governmental bodies, uh, obviously they can play an extremely important role by setting global standards uh, or at least uh, uh, you know, consensus on what uh, the, uh, the kind of set the rules of the role, uh, as, as we call it in, in the US. So uh, for example, um, uh, one agreement I really like recently is the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. Uh, that is an agreement uh, among uh, Singapore, Chile, and New Zealand. You know, not very large economies, but definitely very uh, forward looking. And in this uh, particular Digital Economy Agreement, they set the, uh, the rules and uh, um, uh, <clears throat> the framework for um, uh, important digital issues, everything from data, but also they, they went beyond that. They did discuss emerging technologies such as AI and, and blockchain. I think agreements like that, I think European Union can, can definitely uh, uh, play a role in that is to, to provide a framework, a forward looking framework, not just you know, uh, uh, exposed uh, you know, the dress issue, but ex to anticipate and to set the, um, uh, the, the, and guide the rules. I think that would be tremendously helpful. Um, and uh, on the non-governmental side, I think a public and a private partnership will be extremely uh, uh, helpful, especially in the uh, technology uh, space. Um, a more a bottom-up approach, so to speak, you know, because we all know international official negotiations may, may, may take a while to Chris and Tina's point, but we don't have to wait, right? We can support and, uh, and complement the official process and provide ideas. You know, on the World Economic Forum is the international organization for public and private partnership. We do quite a bit of work in this space. And for example, we actually have a, um, a group on digital payments that consists of central bankers, around the world, so governments, and also uh, uh, companies, you know, payments or uh, mobile company, civil society and uh, academia will bring them all together and say, what, are, what should the rules of the road be for digital payment? And then we present it to the governmental bodies. So yeah, so I think in both the, from the governmental and non-governmental side, there are ways we can uh, push and advocate for international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Mariette, it's your turn. Yes, thank you so much. So I think one important and big question is what should be the organizing principle for cooperation? Uh, we've heard here today a couple of uh, thematic ideas, you know, fairness in the economy, antitrust, the protection of fundamental rights, uh, but also uh, notions of, you know, payment or identity or, or topics that can be uh, important, data governance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also proposals being made that there should be new types of coalitions with countries that share uh, an advantage, uh, an interest, a stake in certain technologies, you know, so-called T10 or, or uh, varying assemblies of countries that, for example, have a semiconductor industry or AI industry or whatnot. And where I think that is problematic is that it actually separates out otherwise like-minded nations. And so I believe the organizing principle for international collaboration should really be the countries that share a belief in democracy, 
that share a commitment to the rule of law and to international law, and that that circle of countries should be as big as possible. And this, I mean, we're, we're talking in a, in a European context, um, is going to ask quite a bit of uh, questions from, from the EU to decide um, where it wishes to compromise, because indeed it has benefited from this first mover advantage. Um, uh, Christina mentioned the Brussels effect, the idea that you know the GDPR set a global standard, and so I think there's an, an expectation and maybe a little bit of complacency sometimes that the EU should be able to always set the rules and others might follow, uh, even if growth, uh, as the minister also said, is something that is uh, something a really important area not to forget. In any case. The question will have to be, what common ground can like-minded countries find and can do so uh, in, in the global perspective, where the urgency should not come from whether neighbors disagree a little bit, but rather whether uh, neighbors can find each other in light of global challenges. Thank, thank you, Mariette. Thanks. Um, Andreas, what's your take on the global dimension? No, thank you very much. That that comes at a very uh, good moment, this question. Um, and I have again the pleasure to put a bit of an, uh, another, an additional point of view on it. I would like to join Mariette on the point that she said it's about, it's important that like-minded uh, nations in the world move on. And I, I think uh, the fact, for example, uh, that the cybersecurity directive that I was the rapporteur of, uh, together with the general data uh, protection regulation in Japan has been taken over more or less 100% shows how like-minded nations can work together and by doing so even facilitate the work for platforms that act globally. Um, we have seen that need for consensus that uh, Siang David uh, has mentioned also in the area of digital taxation where the European Parliament just has adopted an, an important call on regulators and uh, member states to make sure that at OECD or at G20 they will be come together uh, um, to find common principles for digital taxation that is a very important topic. And here, I think uh, all countries in the end will uh, work together because on taxation, they are too much concerned altogether. But it's also true that consensus that has been asked for um, is more difficult to achieve in areas of uh, cooperation uh, and co-regulation on competition and on basic freedom. So the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act cover areas where there are more uh, problems. I mean, on digital markets, from my point of view, it's not a problem between the US and the European Union, and not even with Japan and Australia, because all the conflicts between so-called the old or the non-digital and the digital economy, they are in all countries of the European Union. And by the way, uh, Christina, Germany is not doing something else than the others, because these proposals will be fully harmonized. So there will be one law for the whole of the European Union. Uh, and I think there we agree most of all. The key question will be, from my point of view, what we do in the area where freedom of uh, speech is concerned, where we have our European approach on some regulatory questions. Um, and there, I think the debate will be more difficult to, 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 to make, uh, to do. Uh, and I think the example uh, with Donald Trump's ban of, on Facebook and, uh, and on Twitter is the most um, common example that we know at the moment that shows that on freedom of speech, on fundamental freedoms, there will be some questions where the European have already some difficulties to move together, but when they move together, that can be a bit different uh, compared to other parts of the world. And here, I think we have intelligently to find ways for international cooperation, um, because uh, for sure we want not to uh, uh, accept any reduction of the, the basic freedoms that the European citizens enjoy. Um, and I think there, is, for us, it's most easy to find common ground with the Americans and, for example, the Japanese and the Australians. So we will work hard on this, and we have already some milestones, but now it's getting to the heart of the debate, and we have to be very clear what we want to achieve as Europeans in that. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks a lot. So while we're, we are preparing for uh, questions from, from the audience, uh, I would like to throw uh, an element in our discussion, which is, uh, uh, since we are talking about um, uh, global interaction, um, who wants to say something about uh, one big player in the scene, which is China? How do we um, uh, interact on these topics uh, with China? 
I'm happy to start. Thank you. Um, it, it's been quite popular to uh, say much more about what that we don't want uh, what China is doing. You know, in the United States for a long time, it was the, the very rare issue where bipartisan support could still be found, uh, you know, that, uh, that almost everything coming out of China was harmful. In Europe, I believe there's been uh, a much different view of China, uh, at times naive, for example, about um, strategic takeovers of lobbies, about strategic investments that came with strings attached, for example, when it came to positions on human rights. And we saw uh, in Greece uh, investments in a harbor uh, failure to uh, align with European allies. We see the 17 plus one coalition, very strangely, you know, a separate set of EU member states that uh, that meets with, with Beijing. I think there should be only one um, coalition and that should be organized around Brussels, um, the EU member states together. But having said that, um, if, if a strategy, and I believe it's not a strong one, should not be about being against another country's policies, it's better to act from a position of strength. So to simply be very clear about, you know, what our interests are, what the values are that we want to protect and to consistently stand for that in negotiations, uh, in how we deal with our own private sector. Because I remember well from being a member of the European Parliament, I was on the International Trade Committee. We would travel to Beijing. Uh, the, the businesses from the EU had a long list of issues that they hoped the politicians would raise, as we, uh, we did, because they were legitimate points. Uh, but our Chinese counterparts would nod and smile and say that these businesses were welcome to raise their points themselves, of course, knowing that that would never happen. And so this type of separation, fragmentation along national lines along business versus uh, governmental or political lines is not helping. So I would say the EU needs to have a strong agenda, a strong um, uh, set of issues that it cares about so that it can engage on the basis of confidence and a proactive set of issues that it wishes to work out with China or with others for that matter. Thanks a lot. If you want me, I can add on this uh, very little Thank uh, because you. I think it's a very good, uh, good point. I would say that we can be very proud of the fact that with the Americans, although all these giants at the moment are coming from the US, it's a very transparent atmosphere. We know exactly what the American government is doing. We know exactly how the American business has different points of views and like that, uh, it's very transparent what helps us to understand that there are democratic forces behind that have that or another business behavior. I'm not really sure how this is about China. We have been seeing some companies, they're growing immensely, but apparently uh, the Chinese government doesn't like their, uh, let's say, um, behavior uh, to continue. I mean, we believe that China has definitely a place for digital giants as well. Um, and therefore, um, there will be some discussions, as, Ma as Mariette has said, to be done to understand better the situation uh, there. We know that the cooperation on economic matters has been going forward smoothly, especially also at the Global Competition Authority cooperation with the European Commission. And I think it's also good that the European Commission has recently proposed that uh, um, directive on foreign subsidies, where we want to make clear that those companies that invest in Europe, they have to be treated as European companies. If they have good ideas, they are welcome. But if they are bringing with them a, a hidden state aid, that will not be accepted. And I think like that, we can create that level playing field that uh, Minister Amendola has mentioned before. Yeah, maybe just 30 seconds from me. I'll say, while uh, definitely uh, st uh, stand up for values, try not to maybe um, politicize the, um, the tech space to the extent possible, because I think, you know, if we can find common grounds, it would go a long way to prevent the, uh, you know, the data islands that you know we're, we're, we're seeing happening. Just for example, when it comes to um, data privacy, there's a common perception that you know um, China or uh, Chinese people don't care about data privacy. But if you look at what's happening on the ground, there's actually been a growing a voice and, and backlash against companies who don't value privacy on the ground. So I think you know just one example. Yes, there are definitely a lot more complicated issues, uh, but. Um, trying to find, try, try to find some common grounds will also be helpful to uh, pave the way. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 
So uh, I have a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, uh, by the way, unfortunately, our time is, is really flying. So uh, one question for Christina by, um, from Benedita. So uh, by definition, most of the big tech companies are inherently global. However, as Christina has pointed out, there are two or three different views on how to regulate these companies. So can we expect global coordination to exist to realize what our regulatory, uh, regulatory sorry, silos expect to be uh, created? It's a very good question, and it is going to the core of what I was trying to say. I hear people here making a lot of uh, good points about uh, the need for coordination. My uh, point is that, of course, these companies are global, but we have agreement fundamentally across, I think, a number of jurisdictions and blocks around what are the issues with these companies, what are the problems, how they have manifested themselves. So I don't think we need to debate any further the notion of network effects, the fact that there are economies of scope, scope the, the fact that these market tips, the fact that there is market power, we know that. So the issue is how do we address it? And I think there is a, a difference which is inherent, as I said, in history, in legal, in legal practice and in philosophy, which persists, but I don't think it's fatal. I think that the issue is urgency. That's why I said it's getting on with it rather than just philosophizing about it for another three years. We have cases that have failed to deliver. This is fact. This is why in Europe, when you talk to Americans, they say, well, but you haven't really achieved anything on Google, right? So where did you go with that? So we need to get to a place where you enforce and the enforcement is effective. Uh, regulation is the next stage. And I, uh, to Andreas's point, I know that Germany is not, is going to be harmonized. My point was just, they've, they've uh, uh, evolved the competition law uh, for now in, in a way that allows them to do regulation ahead of the DMA coming into, into force. But it is an interesting experiment that uses competition law to get itself ahead. In a way, I don't mind. I'm happy with the antitrust litigation revival in the US because in the US we've seen complete death for 20 years, nothing was happening until you had the state AGs and then you had the federal governments doing something. By all means, they don't believe in regulation. They think regulation is just common carrier stuff. And they all think that regulation is terrible, 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 you should go there because they think about the regulation of, of, of railways and they, that, that failed. You know, if they achieve something effective, structural change uh, with antitrust litigation, more power to them. I don't think we need to converge on the hat. Let's just kind of do. That's my view. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Christina. A quick question for Vincenzo. Uh, there is a lot of talk of, for international cooperation between EU and the big jurisdiction like the US, Australia. I'm cutting short the question. But can Europe have an international stance if it is internally fragmented at the digital regulation level? Uh, really, a few words, Vincenzo, and then we have to close. Yeah, a few words, uh, just a joke. Sometimes we are stronger when we have to be united with the non-EU member than when we have to discuss among ourselves. So I think that the regulation that uh, MEP was mentioning now yesterday from uh, Vestager on the level playing field is a, is a way. Then if we go on the fiscal damping within the EU, we see that we have many fights. So in this sense, I think we are moving and we have to move faster. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, so one probably last question for Andreas uh, by Philip. Will the data disclosure requirement for prospective gatekeepers in the draft, draft of DMA hinder or help European tech startups relative to startups elsewhere? I mean, that uh, uh, proposal of the European Commission is not yet endorsed by Parliament, so we will have to see as to whether it survives the process of the lawmakers. But obviously, I think, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Minister Amendola has mentioned it, what we want to achieve is that Europe remains an open place for all digital companies and also for all non-digital companies and a place where innovation is flourishing. And to achieve this, we have to find the right balance of freedom of business 
and of regulation. And that's what we aim at. And I, I kindly ask to give us of a bit of patience and, and time still uh, to come to an agreement. In the end, we will see where it ends. But so far, it's not clear that this proposal will survive the parliamentary process. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, we are about to close. Uh, so let me just wrap up. Uh, we need to be quick. We need uh, to be patient and we need to cooperate on this important topic. So I will uh, close our pa uh, panel here. And uh, let me really thank uh, warmly all of you for your really enlightening uh, speeches and ideas. And uh, I really enjoy the diversity and the different questions that we address in this panel and the different views that we have seen. So thanks a lot for uh, being with us uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.